There is virtually no Barbadian who is not enthralled by its bold and infectious dance movements. As a public spectacle, the Barbados landship is almost unsurpassed, commanding a captive crowd of spectators whenever its engine strikes up. It's easy to see this Barbadian cultural institution as a mere provider of public comedy. But those who've delved beyond the surface into the nature and history of this organization paint a far more serious picture. One such person is Marcia Burroughs, a cultural scholar with the University of the West Indies. She holds to the view that the landship masquerade has a far greater significance than meets the eye of the casual observer. Yes, it has been argued they are British uniforms, but they certainly did not look so. By the time the different landship members attached several plumes, lots of gold and green and yellow ropes, that used to be, they used to laugh at and say, oh, they don't look like the British Navy. That's the point. They didn't look like the British Navy. And once they started to dance what they call their naval maneuvers, certainly they were not being the British Navy because no Navy dances. So if we're seeing culture as something which is creolized, which is a combination and it evolves and it grows, you've got your uniforms and we in a sense have been taught to see them as mimicking black people, black working class and poor, mimicking white British culture. I'm saying no, I'm saying if we see the uniform as a cloak, that then they can do their dances, do their marchings from before, keep their susu and do all those things, then we get a another analysis or another reading of this thing that we know now as, as the landship. Tracing the origins of the landship takes us to the 1860s and one Moses Wood, a Barbadian who served in the British Navy and lived in Wales and England. The story goes that on returning home, he organized a society for purposes of mutual aid and to reproduce the camaraderie and discipline of naval life. Landship researcher Aviston Downs mentions 1863 and 1868 as the years when this might have happened. Downs says there is no documented evidence that the movement began in either of those years, but he spoke of documented evidence of the ship's existence from the 1890s. And according to Downs, notwithstanding the distinctive Barbadian characteristics of the local ship, the practice of parading in military gear was not unique to Barbados at the time. The landship is bigger than Barbados. In terms of how we conceptualize the landship, it has been seen as something unique to Barbados, peculiar to Barbados. I have contended that in fact you need to look at the whole expression of maritime culture across the Black Atlantic, bearing in mind that from the 18th century, blacks were very prominent as members of ships' crews in the British Navy. Significantly so, and that, and, that, and, and that in terms of spreading culture and ideology from South Africa, West Africa, North America, Caribbean, that you have the influence of seamen. So it's, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, surprising to me that you have a, a oral tradition that suggests that this man lived at Cardiff and Southampton, within port cities in Britain, where in fact there would have been local communities of sailors of all shades, and from and from the, the white black diaspora, the, the crewmen, Caribbean blacks, British soldiers, British sailors, sorry. Poor whites too. Poor whites, of course, and, th and therefore in that context, you're having a kind of hybridization that's taking place beyond the, the insular context of Barbados. Stripped of all its regalia and choreography, the landship functions much like a working class friendly society providing its membership with cash insurance for purposes of illness, maternity or death. As its name suggests, it pretends to be a ship on land, its leadership bearing such naval titles as Lord High Admiral, Commander and Captain, and bedecking themselves in gold tassels, medals and peak caps. Wait. Captain Vernon Watson, the head of the ship. Well, the, launch, the uniform is the, is, 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 is the, the, the whole body, the, 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 the the composition uh, of the uh, of the movement because if you know if you know let, let me go back there really because that's a very important question the main because we interpret the navy that is that is from the inception was the words come here uh, and uh, in the year 1863 and you say that he gained because he missed the which is regular not even be he missed that life at sea 
uh, and he get together some of his his. We don't know whether it was his age group or younger or older people, uh, but he he get uh, some fellas and bestow on them all the uniforms and ranks and regalia, uh, and then put offices uh, ranks to, to fierce fellas. And we have we have from the admiral back down to the skylight board. Women came into the movement by the early 1900s, designated as nurses or stars. The ships which kept their independence named themselves after British naval vessels, Iron Duke, Nelson, Dreadnought and Cornwall. Each ship had a regular meeting place called, not unexpectedly, a dock with masts and sails on the roof. Uh, uh, from the inception of the launch the main nights, Friday nights is always a very significant night. It's, it's what you call a ship night. A ship night is where uh, we meet and we pay our dues, our contributions. Uh, like, 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 what you have, well, this is a modern thing. Uh, you just had the, the, the money you pay will record in the book. Uh, but now we introduce a, a, a contribution card, something like this, where what you pay is, uh, is recorded in your card and in the book. As a working class movement, the landship expanded significantly during the 1920s and by the early 30s there were three fleets of over 60 ships with about 3,000 men and 800 women. We know now what is called the Barbados landship as one ship, but we're talking about several ships that in the 1920s and 30s we can find 30 something ships. There are claims that there were ships that were over 100 and something persons. They'll be even in the, 90, yeah, in, 200, in the 1970s we know we had about 12 ships, 8 to 12 ships when there was the next revival of the ship. So it meant that you can have a land ship or two or three or four in St. Michael and more probably two in St. Peter, two in St. Philip, wherever. And each ship had a captain and each ship then would have the nurses and the commanders. You had an overall admiral, the last one was Admiral Marshall that we've spoken about, but you had different ships. No ship can travel without an engine, not even a land ship. But this ship's movements or movementations are generated in its choreography and the engine driving those movements is the Tuk Band. It was a crucible of historical importance mm -hmm. in terms of the dance movements. Mm -hmm. All the things that you can see, I mean, Vang Lo and all that, but there were, there were complex movements that, that people used to be involved in. And the better bands had all these complex movements that they could do. Yeah, and that, and that depends know? a lot about who was, the, who was leading the ship because in, from St. Joseph, I've had someone tell me about the 1930s in St. Joseph's where they actually used to scrub, part of yes. the movement was scrubbing the oh, deck. That, really scrubbing the deck, something that we don't see. And, and certain things for the women to do, certain things for the men to do, certain things for the quartermaster yeah. to do. In the hands of top connoisseurs like these, this motley assortment of musical instruments comprising bass drum, kettle drum, flute and triangle is capable of sailing any land ship through rough seas. Tuk musician Wayne Willock describes the relationship between the land ship and the Tuk band. The land ship really existed first and the, the, the Tuk band became the engine of that ship to the extent that, okay, as we were here now you would see when the land ship first coming on you might hear a waltz being played. Right. The waltz as a slow beat will represent that the boat now move off right. and you're only hitting about 20 pounds of steam. <laughs> so the boat moving fairly slowly. Then you increase your steam, you pump up your steam to about 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. The 40 pounds of steam now will be represented by the fasci or the march, okay. cause now you're up, you're more up Step tempo. Up a little bit. When you hit the rail tuck now, mm -hmm. and you're up this, you're hitting 60 and 80 pounds of steam, mm -hmm. and the boat sailing. Hello, that everybody. is the ship, <laughs> you know, yeah, the, the steam is, is, is what will be pushing the ship, and the ship, well, we call it a land ship. So the steam is what we really the call steam, the 440. Steam, yeah, the 44 rail top is the, when you get into 80 pounds of steam and the boat really tickling really and rocking. moving through the water. You know what I mean? So, but then what happened is as there was, it became a time when the top band was so recognized that it became an entity in itself. 
that it wasn't just then the engine of the large ship. You had a large ship with the top, that's one entity. Then you, you could get that top by itself. The engine by itself. The engine by itself, no, with the characters, no, which would be reminiscent of the African heritage of these characters, because this character thing, the African thing, you have the Moko Jambi all through the Caribbean, you have the Mother Sally, which is the Dame Lorraine, is the what all sort of thing. You have the Shaggy Bear type of character, the Shags, covered face, all I'm through the right. Uh, you have the donkey. I mean, this equestrian thing. This there was an African tribe that used to do this on, on a, a normal basis, but instead of using donkey, they had horse. Okay. But used to dress up the horses, and you know this pretty costume thing. So our thing about donkey is following that tradition, but we also have behind that the whole steel donkey thing right. that used to hear a steel donkey right. coming down so I move out the way and that sort of thing and of course the donkey was used to transport the cans mm -hmm. from the field to the factory and that's how the economy was built so there's a lot of things tied up together with these characters you know and most of those tunes were uh, mission songs playing in the temple that the flukemen uh, prefer to play in uh, this is this is not really known publicly, you know. In other words, people don't realize that the land ship never played banjo or anything. In fact, not the one my ship. Even now, we play all mission songs. Ify Wilkinson, another tok percussionist, described the special dynamics of the Barbadian tok rhythms. The basic fundamentals of playing is, and the kettle is with two sticks. And we have a gentleman here that we can actually have a look at that briefly. And if you're looking at the six, uh, the feel of six are notes that are played equally with each hand. And then you identify a louder or softer note in order to help you also connect with the rhythm. So a good way of doing that is basically, um, we're gonna start with the basis that I've showed you, which is the two simple notes for the six. And it's played right in the center of the drum. So this is a what you get out of the six. If you look at it as a raw two sticks hitting the drum, this is what it looks like. Any variations you make from here help you to identify the rhythm as a unit. But that's basically having a, a, a listen to the six without using the drum as Barbadians do, because I, I want to stress this very carefully, that whilst these drums are played across the world, including the Caribbean, the only persons that play these drums this way are Barbadians, hence the name Tukban from a Bajanian point of view, a Bajana point of view, however you want to put it. It's a local traditional thing that we have now developed and it's based upon these simple things. Now going to what we call the chime, so you get the difference in sound. All that's being done here is to move the stick from one location to another. It changes the tone, it gives you that unique Barbadian sound. And you'll find the elderly guys or the more traditional guys will tell you you're playing the kettle and you're playing the chime. The chime would turn out to be the ending of the drum. If you stop playing the chime, you're actually playing the same thing over and over. What identifies the differences in song is the moving of the stick from one point to the other. In accordance with modern tradition, the flute and penny whistle are the instruments of melody for the top band. But other instruments are and have been used in this role as well. Among them the fiddle, the saxophone and the voice. It's only in the early 1900s the fiddle went out and the flute came in and it's not even a local flute for the most part, it's, a, it's an English flute. Right. Uh, what we call the, the penny whistle, the C flute, the Clark flute. Uh, some people here and other places would have been able then to get some bamboo and right. uh, actually and create a, a wooden flute. Right. But the point is the flute had come in then. So you have that progression from singing with the tuck to, to fiddle with the tuck to flute with the top, I know Seema got oh, sax with the top. <laughs> well, that's interesting. You know, and I just put top in my jar show. Oh, okay. So it just traveling, you know, traveling, it just traveling. the development. The music that was played was the same music that was played away from the land shape. Yeah. One was singing with a concert and then they play instrumental. And I think that's how the instrumental aspect of Tukban evolved because in contemporary times, a lot of those guys didn't know the lyrics and, and therefore uh, you will see it. But what is interesting is if you read Attila Dehan's book where Attila talks about uh, 
team on the long brown gal calls you for me. Uh, something which was burnt cane. I had a piece of burnt cane and, and ground them ground and so I'll burn them down. Um, murder in the market, murder, and there was another one. There were four songs, and I discovered a fifth one. But the fourth four songs that were popular in the 1900s, remember, in those days, melodies remained the same for donkey years. Right? It wasn't until the 20s that then you get, began to get a variety of melodies. But what he was referring to, and, and he said it was too stiff for a Lego in the context of Trinidad. But you only have to look at contemporary use of the took in terms of, let's say, Edwin Yarwood, whose, whose lyrics parallel the rhythm of, of, of the music. Not, not necessarily um, Punka, because Punka was struggling against arrangers who arranged everything traditionally. Um, Punka, had to, Punka had to add in the took at the beginning or at the end, right? But the, 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 the contemporary things from the 94, begin to use took as an integral part of the whole music, the lyrics, the words, if you listen to them, the words had the cadence of the, the rhythms and so on, right? And I'm saying that if as early as 1900 the music penetrated Trinidad, it means the took had a long an existence before that. Veteran took musicians like John Hunt, known as Seaman, and Old Man Ho are good repositories of traditional took band melodies. That is a, a favorite song, is it? Mama and Papa were sailing one day down by the cold riverside. Some of them turned to the boatman and said, Oh, oh, me over the side. Oh, me over the side, boatman. Oh, me over the side. Someone out there just is waiting for me. So, oh, me over the cave. Now, the gentleman, buddy, um, a story tongue near T. Herbert. T. Herbert was to bring these flutes original. Um, at the time of float, it cost 75 cents. They cut a Clark float. Up to now, they ain't got back the original float yet that the top band used to play with. So the original float you said was a Clark? It's a Clark float. But the trade, the trade didn't make the float, but the original float, I had one home, home to show them, but I can't get the fun now. That is the float that used to make the top band ring. In, in the waltz, you would get the, the, the song Adam and Eve, which, which is the real authentic traditional right. waltz song. Banana, da, da, da. Right, correct. And then, as, 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 as Punko would say, you, you know, you, you build up to, you, you're building up to full right. steam, where you get medium steam or the, or the fast, you know, you, you get a, another traditional song, we call it the, uh, the Caledonian. Caledonian. You know, yeah. da, 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 da. right. So, that is one of the traditional songs. And then, with the, with the fast tuck now, you, you, we have one or two songs. We have a song, you know, Burn Cane. Burn Cane. Like. Burn Cane. Yeah. Yeah. Then, we have Granum Grong. These are the real traditional songs. Yeah. And your favorite song that, that is, uh, that is Suki. That's my favorite. I'm recently now took by rhythm. Right, right, okay, right. It was very, that was a real traditional top band song. So, yes, there are, there are a couple of traditional songs that we still, you know, incorporate in what we do. I mean, I play a lot of like, well, familiar songs of, of the present time, you know, waltz, classy, whatever, and top by still make sure, you know, to keep the tradition as part of it. I, I, the majority of times I always start with one of the traditional songs, right. whether it be the Fassi, the Waltz, or the 4-4, the, four, four, the, the top. In more recent times, the saxophone joined the list of Tuk melody makers. The Rose Hill Tuk Band is one of the groups that use the saxophone. Right now, the way we use the sax, you don't get as much, well, we in the North don't get as much flute men as before. It's hard to get flute men in Barbados. You will get killed men and pierced men, but not a flute man. 
Between, between the saxophone, between the flute and the saxophone, is our terms different fingering all together. The flute carry six notes. But what you got to do with the flute, to get high notes, you got to cut the notes. Still, you could play not like the saxophone, you got to cut the notes with your finger. To get high notes. Okay. But the saxophone now, got on some notes on it, you got the high, high octave, you can make another high octave for yourself. Once you got the book, I know what you're doing. The saxophone got high F sharp, it got high G, G sharp mechanism, but you got to know the finger to get it. Historians and students of Barbadian folklore are still uncertain about the origins of the name Tuk. Elombe Motley says the music has been known by other names. People in St. Andrew call it Gumbe, mm -hmm. right? There are uh, other people call it Wax Banani, mm -hmm. other people call it Rock Tuck, and then the more modern name is... Uh, it's shortening Tuck. Shortening the Tuck. But it is interesting, I was saying that earlier with us, before we started, you asked about the role of whites and blacks, because there was a white man called Braga in Shoree village that, that gave me the name. He said, oh, you're talking about Goombe. And I asked Maureen Warner Lewis about the origin of Goombe, as you know, in Jamaica, to find out exactly why it was called Goombe in that particular area. And then Christchurch here tend to call it um, Rakata. And those areas in Sir Philip that call it wax manani. Now in Bermuda, there is a thing called the gumbe, yes. which is like the top band, but it's faster. Uh -huh. And, boop, 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 and, and it's just the same monkey thing, but the are different feeling all together. Mm -hmm. And the costumes is beautiful, mm -hmm. as peace and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Different places, different names. Mm -hmm. In 1932, with the help of Charles Duncan O'Neill's Democratic League, just over 30 ships united to form the Barbados Landship Association and launched their literary organ, the Landship Review. Further political support for the movement came in the 1950s from the government of the then Premier Grantley Adams, who hosted parades at its Tyrocourt home. Marcia Burroughs talks about the involvement of middle-class Barbadians in the early years of the organization. Yeah, the Landship headquarters were somewhere near James Street in Bridgetown, and at that time it was called the Land Two separate words, Land Ship Association, an umbrella association in which prominent members of the middle class, like Hugh Cummins, who was going to become prime minister after Premier, Hugh Premier, Gordon, Premier, Cummins. Hugh Gordon Hugh Cummins. Cummins, they were involved as well. So we had the middle and class the coming in with writing skills, analytical skills, and deciding to give an organizational structure to what essentially was a very working class organization. But the ship has long passed its glory days, and in fact, there are serious doubts among its leadership about its future. Faced with a dramatic decline in the number of ships, the current head of the organization, Captain Vernon Watson, grouped the remaining units into one Barbados land ship. When I came in in San Vito, I figured it was I think it was necessary where the, we should have come together, uh, I believe, to enhance the, the status of the landship. By forming this association where I went around and we get uh, two members from each city section and uh, formed the association. There were six units, so you had two from each unit uh, form the association, and that is how the, the Barbados landship. Captain Watson has been waging his own battle against the threatened demise of the landship, trying to recruit young people to the movement. His efforts have borne only modest fruits. I, it is myself, it is, it is the quartermaster, Elton Graves. You have Roland there, Commander Gips. Uh, and if anything should happen to me, I, I don't know if, how the landship will survive. That's why I say now. We have uh, Charles, he have his group in, in, in Rosal, that go by name of Rosal Tukman. Uh, that might count, right? But if you see in this uniform, in the uniform, I don't know, I don't know how well it will continue. 
But unless there's a dramatic turnaround in the fortunes of the movement, the inevitable demise of the present ship will bring to an end performances like this. Closing once and for all, another chapter in the socio-cultural history of Barbados.